You bring.
great to pray together. Father God, thank you that uh, the song that we've just been able to listen and sing along with uh, reminds us of our primary identity in you, that um, you called us and you know us, you knew us long before we were ever planned, and you call us a child of God, part of your family, loved, cherished, included. And Lord, that gives us a dignity. We might be called a lot of things by a lot of other people. We carry titles, we carry names. People might say things about us that may or may not be true. But the dignity that comes from you is a dignity that causes children of the living God. So Lord, today, in the midst of our ordinary lives, may we carry that sense of purpose and that sense of bearing. That Lord, we yours that we belong to you, that you have marked us out, that you have put your hand upon us, that you've given us a purpose and you've given us a family together. So Lord, may your blessing rest on us as uh, we, we enjoy that relationship with you in the name of Jesus. 
Well, that was great. Um, so good to, to be reminded and, and so good to be able to sing along with those songs. So thank you. Um, just as that was all beginning, um, something broke in. Uh, I think someone came in with Unmuted and uh, you will have heard uh, a bit of a racket and uh, uh, language that is unfortunate. Uh, so I can only apologise, but I think it came from someone coming in on the call rather than anything RN, but sorry, you had to hear that. The um, the sermon this morning is um, from Acts chapter twenty. Um, it's uh, one of the Luke stories that, in some ways, is um, is amusing. There's, there is some sort of sense of which that in the midst of. Uh, all Luke's talking about Paul and about the, the journey that Paul's on and the journey with the church. There is a sense in which following Jesus has those moments where you laugh and you laugh because what you might have thought would end in tragedy ends with blessing. There's often, I don't know about you, but often in our own lives, there are times where you think this is not going to end well. And, and that feeling of anxiety grows within you. Um, and yet it doesn't end that way. It ends with laughter. It's what happens when God breaks in. Following Jesus is not always about gritting your teeth. Sometimes it's like in the midst of it, realizing, God, you did far more than we ever imagined. So we're going to listen to the reading. Maggie's going to read that for us and then um, we'll go and um, listen to the sermon. Now, last time this happened, I wasn't aware that um, as I was uh, watching myself <laughs> preaching, which is odder than you might think, as I was watching myself uh, uh, preach, you could see my face watching me. And uh, some of you said you could see me uh, sort of wince for a moment. So this time, in order that you can't see any wincing, I'm going to block my own screen. So you'll just see a blank screen because I don't want you to see what I think of me uh, as I'm preaching. Anyway, that's a bit of a long verbal. But Maggie, if you're there, can you unmute yourself and uh, read the passage for us? That'd be great. Acts chapter 20. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He travelled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Thanks a lot, Max. So, Jay, I'm going to hand over and you can stream uh, that for us. It feels like there's loads of places in Salford that are almost secret. I mean, they're huge areas. Look at it. I don't know if you know where this is. It's a place called Livia. It's in Pendlebury. It's not far from the motorway. It's just off the main road. But it, when you're here, it can feel like no one else knows about it. 
and yet it's brilliant. You see the views and it's a great place to come and walk. We come down here quite regularly, really, and we just chat and put the world to right. Sometimes when we're not sure what we should be doing next, we come and there's, it's a place where we just try and discern what a good direction for the future would be. And, and when we're worried about stuff, it's a good place to come and, and reflect on what's going on. It's a place to pray. It's a place just to be still. To be honest, it's a place just to enjoy. But it's a place where often things start to fall into place. In a strange sort of way, it's my Troas. We just heard the reading from Acts 20 about Paul in Troas. This is the second time that Luke has told us that Paul's been to Troas. The first time it was the place where they were really confused. They had felt that the doors had closed to them to go all the obvious places and they get to Troas and it's at Troas, the place of absolute confusion, that becomes the place where a new direction is open for them. It's where they see the vision of the man of Macedonia says, come over to Europe, come and preach here. And so they go. And here Paul is again in Troas. But this time it's not about confusion hey, he's facing there, it's about anxiety. We've got a problem with the video. The reason he's in Troas is because Jay? there's been a Okay, so rather than you watching this, I think, is it only coming through on gallery? Is that the problem for folks? Is that, that's what's happening? Okay, um, so it's good for some of you yeah. and for others of you, it's only in gallery. Okay, I'm, it's fine for us. If you could all pop round to Nevin Lorna's house, they can see it really well. Um, so I don't know if that's possible. Oh, and Fran. So I think there's some of you who obviously are in the cheaper seats. There's a lot of you that are saying it's fine and few of you. Um, if you go to the view, I think if you go to speaker view, that should help you. Okay. All right. There's lots of you saying it's all good. So we've stopped this unnecessarily. Um, but if you can, you're on, if you can make sure you're on speaker view, Okay, shall we try again? It just seemed that it would be churlish to have left a third of you out. This morning's going so well so far, don't you think? Um, shall we? Uh, shall we start again, Jay? Thanks. It feels like there's loads of places in Salford that are almost secret. I mean, they're huge areas. Look at it. I don't know if you know where this is. It's a place called Livia. It's in Pendlebury. It's not far from the motorway. It's just off the main road. But it, when you're here, it can feel like no one else knows about it. And yet it's brilliant. You see the views and it's a great place to come and walk. We come down here quite regularly, really and we just chat and put the world to right. Sometimes when we're not sure what we should be doing next, we come and there's it's a place where we just try and discern what a good direction for the future would be. And, and when we're worried about stuff, it's a good place to come and, and reflect on what's going on. It's a place to pray. It's a place just to be still. To be honest, it's a place just to enjoy. But it's a place where often things start to fall into place in a strange sort of way, it's my Troas. We just heard the reading from Acts 20 about Paul in Troas. This is the second time that Luke has told us that Paul's been to Troas. The first time it was the place where they were really confused. They had felt that the doors had closed to them to go all the obvious places and they get to Troas and it's at Troas, the place of absolute confusion, that becomes the place where a new direction is open for them. It's where they see the vision of the man of Macedonia it says, come over to Europe, come and preach here. And so they go. And here Paul is again in Troas. But this time it's not about confusion he's facing there, it's about anxiety. 
The reason he's in Troas is because there's been a threat to his life. He's had all the adventures in Philippi and Thessalonica and riots and imprisonments and adrenaline. But now he's in Troas again. And now it all feels a bit more anxious. As I said, people have tried to sort of attempt to take his life. And he's escaped them by going via Troas. He's got a whole group of people with him, a team of people, a bunch of guys who've come from all the different uh, areas and the different cities. And together, they collected money to take to Jerusalem, which is where they're heading, to give to the poor. But the back of their mind is always the nervousness. Would the Jews in Jerusalem accept the money that had been from tainted Gentile sources? There was always the anxiety of how would he be received. And then, and probably most, was the, the nagging concern he had about a church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had, was a real ongoing struggle, really. I think the church hurt Paul in so many different ways. And I think the church at times felt Paul dealt with them harshly. And he'd sent them a letter. And in 2 Corinthians, where you, you, you hear a different side to the apostle, um, a side of him that's quite vulnerable and raw, he talks about having sent, he calls it a painful letter via Titus and he reflects in the second chapter of 2 Corinthians about when he's in Troas he's not got any peace of mind because he's waiting for Titus to come back and Titus is not there and he's not sure whether the church in Corinth is going to be okay whether Titus is going to be okay Troas this city a few chapters earlier have been place of confusion and now massive place of anxiety. And yet it's in Troas, this, this city, that a story happens that in some ways is quite comical. So in this place Troas, Luke tells just one story from the seven days that Paul is there. And it happens on the first day of the week. Now, for those people, the first day of the week, as it is for us, would be Sunday. The first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. They weren't celebrating with Jews on Sabbath. This first day of the week, Sunday in Troas, was a working day. And so they would gather at the end of the working day and they'd come together and they'd worship together, they'd speak together, they'd share their lives together and they'd break bread. And, and of course that wasn't communion just in the way we do it with one little bit of cracker and one little uh, sort of sip of juice. It was a meal. But within that meal, they would remind themselves of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in eating together, they'd remind themselves that they belong to one another. This is a community of people gathered around Jesus who has died and rose again and is alive and with them. And Luke tells us that Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking till midnight. Well, he had loads to tell them. He'd just written Romans. He'd been thinking and reflecting on the meaning of Jesus' death, on what his resurrection meant, the work of the Spirit, what it meant to be Jews and Greeks together, what this would look like in the context of an empire. He had loads to tell him. It's not hard to imagine how he would carry on talking. The sermon wouldn't have been just one man speaking all the time, though. It probably would have been interrupted and people would have asked him questions and he would have been able to dialogue with them. So it's kind of like a to and fro scenario, but it's midnight and he's still going on. And the lamps in the room are giving off an odour and perhaps the low light would mean it's not hard to imagine that someone, at least one person, might fall asleep. It's not the end of the world, is it? Unless you're sitting on a windowsill 
of a third story building and you fall out, then it's pretty important. And that's what happened. This young guy called Eutychus, Luke says, was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. And when he was sound asleep, fell to the ground and they picked him up dead. They run downstairs, he's dead. And Paul runs behind them going, no, 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 don't, don't be alarmed. He's alive, there's life here. It's a beautiful little picture. It's, a, it's almost a comical little scene. It's one where you read it and you smile because who's not been Eutychus before? And there's something almost sort of farce-like about the thing because Eutychus means lucky and he was. But there's gotta be more. Preachers have struggled with this when they've come to it in the past. Some preachers have used this passage and said, see, you mustn't fall asleep while the preacher's preaching, otherwise you'll die. Yeah, maybe. Others have turned it round the other way around and said, no, actually, preachers, don't keep on speaking so long because you need to take notice of what's going on with people. Yeah, maybe. But why does Luke include this story? Luke tells stories that are miraculous. He tells of new life. But normally, there's a purpose with them. He chooses only to tell some stories. So what's the purpose of this? And what's the purpose that those who will listen to this story later, what will they see? You see, it's how stories work, isn't it? Someone tells a story and it's got the meaning of what happened at the time. It's kind of like, wow, look, that happened. But those who hear it and listen and think about it go, yeah, but I see more in that story because of the situation we are facing now. It's how stories work. It's almost how stories become thicker and deeper and more meaningful because we see more things in them than when we're just looking at the surface. Let me try to explain what I mean. Years ago, when I came to the end of working at a college, I had a leaving due and um, they bought me a present and this was it. It was one of those situations where at that leaving due, they handed it to me and they said, open it, open it. It had all been wrapped up and so I opened it and as I looked at it, I, I didn't quite know what I felt about it, to be honest. For them, it was clear perhaps why they bought it. It was a gift of some significance. It, it, it has value, actually. And um, I guess they wanted to give it me because, I don't know, maybe they were just grateful for some of the stuff I'd done while I'd worked there. There's a connectedness between the, the guy who painted it and one of the other members of staff. And, and so there was some connection that, that they were, were using, really, to give me the picture. And it was a farewell gift. It was like, here you go, Neil. Thank you. May the Lord be with you. They had a clear meaning in the gift that they gave me. But what they couldn't have begun to imagine is the meaning I started to invest in it. When we brought it home and we put it up, we grew used to the slightly mysterious, slightly jazzy feel of it. It felt like, yeah, that's got a mean to us because we're music lovers and, and we listen to a lot of music and, and it's got that dynamism in it. And the fact that it's a keyboard connects with Maggie and I don't think they meant that, but we saw in it something of that, that somehow it was more personal and personalized for us. And the fact that it was a picture and not what I'd asked for, someone had said to me on the sly, what, what could we buy you? And I said a sat nav, because at the time I thought that would be really useful. Now, of course, all those years later, that would have long gone by. But now the picture will, will keep that all the way through the years. So it had had one meaning for the people who'd given it at the time. But it's got another layer of meaning for those who've received it. It's what happens with stories all the time. So let's look at this story that Luke tells us again and just see if there are other layers of meaning that perhaps 
we can see when we look at it a little more closely. So it's a gathering in an upstairs room. The end of a working day, loads of working people crammed into a room and a visitor who's loved is speaking. And people are eating and asking questions. They're breaking bread together, something they would have done regularly. They're allowing the hours to go by. They're not wanting to leave. They're doing church. It's a place where people fall, where people drift into heavy sleep, where people are in danger of being lost. But this is a community where there's life, where death doesn't get the last word. So as we read this story, we're left with that question, well, what does it mean for our church today? How do we make sense of this? And I think there's two things that I really want to emphasize today about the story. And the first is about our church can be and will be a place where people can face anxieties honestly in the midst of new life. I said earlier that one of the anxieties that Paul had was, would Corinth be okay? And in 2 Corinthians, when he's writing to them, he explains that although he'd had no peace of mind in Troas, eventually Titus came and things were okay. All the things that Paul had feared hadn't happened. The church had accepted Titus, they still loved Paul, and perhaps most importantly of all, they still love Jesus. The anxieties didn't get the last word. The resurrection of Jesus did. Most of our adult life, me and Mags have just had backyards. We've not had gardens as such. We've just had yards with pots and stuff we tried to grow in them. But a couple of years ago when we moved for the very first time, we had a garden of any sort of size at all. It backs onto the East Lanks. And um, because of that, it gets all the leaves. And so our garden is really just full of leaves at the moment. And last year, when they all fell, I, I, I kind of did what anybody, I guess, would do. I didn't know much about gardens. I just collected them all and put them in the pink bin and the Salford Council took them away. But this year I've been reading. And this year, I recognize that this stuff It's not just stuff that's died. It's not just things that have been sort of discarded and, and just need to be put in the bin. This is the basis of growth for the future. So I read about it and uh, I was advised to gather them all up and put them in a, a, a sort of a, a mesh and the idea is that in two years, perhaps three, there'll be good soil there. What I'm doing with all the leaves of the season is I'm making good soil. And when I was doing it, when I was gathering it all, I'd, I felt God say this to me, that it's like all of this anxiety that in one sense, we just want to get rid of. God says, well, actually, if you allow me to be part of it, then actually, because of the resurrection of Jesus, because of life, something new can come. It's almost like you make good soil and something new can grow. First thing I'd want to say about this church at Troas is this that all the anxiety that Paul had, all of the anxiety the church had about this young man that fell out of the window and was dead, actually, their anxiety was not well-founded. 
Paul's anxieties didn't come true. The church at Troas found that Eutychus was alive because there's life here because of Jesus. To those of us who struggle with anxiety, I want to say we can be a church where the anxieties meet the resurrection of Jesus and something new can be born from them. And the second thing about this church in Troas and the way it relates to us in Salford is this. We've long said that we want to be a church that pays close attention to one another. And I guess I want to say two things. Firstly, we've got to pay attention when we recognise that someone's drifting or in danger of falling. It's probably been really tested this year because we've just not been together that often. But we've got to pay attention to one another because actually it's quite possible that from time to time folks will drift, that they'll drift off, that they'll fall. But our church needs to be a place where if that happens it's not a tragedy because we'll notice and secondly there is life. There's life here. It doesn't need to be the end. We're recording this just a few days after we've been told that a vaccine is on the way. It's brilliant news. But it'll probably take a while for us to be able to go back to meeting together as we used to do on Sundays at least. But now we've got to start doing the stuff we can do. But the moment you can meet with one other person outside, do so. Go for walks, meet folks, connect. Stay in touch. <laughs> Ring, text, call, whatever. And when little groups of people can get back together again, take the opportunity and eat together. Because when we eat together and we talk together and we pray together, then actually what we're doing is we're holding one another so that there's less chance that we'll fall, less chance that we'll drift away. We'll be a church that pays attention. And then when we come back together to worship, it'll be a culmination of all of this. In that church in Troas, a place for Paul that had been one of confusion that became a place of new direction, a place of anxiety that became one of recognising the resurrection of Jesus, a place where someone had fallen but actually there was life. I see a picture of what it means for us to be a church of new life together for the sake of the world. A place where we walk together and hold each other safe together, faithful to Jesus together. I know that it might not be possible if you've got a lot of little ones around you, but I just wonder whether um, we can take a moment just of stillness and just pray. And in the praying, um, what I want to ask God is for God to make clear to you what he wants to remind you about. It might be the encouragement of the anxieties that meet the resurrection and that possibility of new hope. Or it might be an encouragement to actually say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play my part here. I'm going to play my part for the sake of other people. I'm going to be the one um, that will, will look out others. So let's pray. Spirit of God, as we're separated, come Holy Spirit and rest upon us. As each of us are in our own situations and we're uh, wrestling with our own situations, come Holy Spirit. 
reminders of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus that does meet our anxieties and that does transform them. Holy Spirit, connect us with one another again, I pray. Lord, come and speak into our lives about this or other things, just in the stillness of our own rooms. Just come, Holy Spirit, and rest upon us, we pray. We ask in your name. We're going to... Uh, listen join with the band as they sing another song but during that while that happens i want to just give you the opportunity just as that is happening to begin to think okay so what is what has the lord reminded me of what is worth sharing and I'm going to give you opportunity to do that actually to share um what you think the lord might be saying to you or to us just things that have been perhaps just remind us to yourself of what's significant and then remind us that might be helpful to us all. So as we listen and sing with the band, be alert to the spirit. And you can put it in chat, of course you can put it in chat. And um, we can use that then to encourage one another um, with what we might feel the Lord is saying to us. Really hope that a number of you would be able to do that this morning. But I'm going to hand over to Jay and he'll take us to the band to allow that to be played for. And then as that's happening, you take the opportunity in chat. Might be a prayer, might be a scripture, might be a word from the Lord, might just be your thoughts. It might, you know, you don't want to put too much um, on that. You just may say, this is what I was thinking while I was uh, listening. And uh, but we offer it to one another. It's one of the ways we stay connected. So I'm going to hand back to Jay.
some of you have written some stuff and um, you can if you're on this call you can you can see that as well as I can but um, the um, that sense of a number of things going on for people so let's just try and make sense of them together that reminder of the song bind us together with a cause that can't be broken but then some stuff about what the Lord is reminding individuals of and where the Lord is reminding me that he goes before me to prepare the way. He's beside and behind me at all times, even when carrying me, where even when I fail. That sense there's a time for everything, a season for every activity in the heavens. God has made everything beautiful in its time. I'll come to Ian's in a moment. Reminder, uh, yeah. Yvonne, thanking the Lord that you bring hope into our hopeless situations. Jill said, I had a really vivid picture on Friday, a breath on a fireplace and the ashes being blown away. God often uses the image of a fire to talk to us about purifying, removing the dross and the mess to reveal the pure and the lasting underneath. Perhaps there are people who feel that so much been burnt away in this time, even angry at God that he's removed things you thought you needed. But under the ashes is revealing the glints of what lasts, the eternal promises he's made to you. That sense of life being in the midst of the situations that often uh, just feel like loss. And perhaps it links with the, the piece that Ian wrote. When Frank asked me for some incidental music for the preaching film, uh, I found a song I'd written after attending Albert Downs's funeral. In the funeral, the minister prayed a prayer which contained the words, rest in peace and rise in glory, which became the title of the song. I didn't know what Neil was going to be preaching when I picked the song, but the words, death doesn't get the last word, seemed to really resonate, especially at a time when the fear of death is higher than usual. That sense of the Lord, as Yvonne says, bringing hope into our hopeless situations, the, that sense that... The mess doesn't get the final word. The people who bring vows, things into our life. Sunita says, I've been struggling these past weeks, feeling so anxious about finishing the nursing studies and qualifying. So anxious I thought of quitting, but I was reminded of truth and those words that God spoke to Joshua after he'd called him, that he has kept her going during those times. That sense that actually in the midst of our very ordinary lives, not only does the Lord speak to us, but actually we can help one another. Not only are we to hold on to the promise that death doesn't get the final word, but we act in ways that show that death doesn't get the final word. I suppose there's nowhere that's more vividly demonstrated than in communion. That actually the death of Jesus, the body that was broken, is broken, really broken, crucified, and given in order that life might flow, that we would not live just with death, but with life. So if you have bread and juice or something to drink with you, then take it and eat and remind yourself that your situation meets the resurrecting power of Jesus and new life begins. Something new can be born. Take it and eat. And take the cup. The cup that reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was shed. Linked so often um, to the Passover, that sense of God knowing that we're his. The blood that saves us. Linked in our own minds very often with sin and the fact that our sins are forgiven. And it's not just that the stuff that goes on in our lives meets the resurrecting power of Jesus, but our own failures meet the resurrecting power of Jesus. And you're not left there, but you're resurrected to life. The cup that speaks of the blood of Jesus. Lord, I take the opportunity to pray this morning for those of us who are fearful because of the mess, because of things that aren't working out well, because of the things that we're facing that, we're, that 
we are understandably and reasonably fearful of. Lord, I pray for those of us amongst us this morning who look out and it just looks bleak. I pray that to those people, they will hear your voice in our voices that shout to them, there's life, do not be afraid. Lord, thank you that your resurrection, the resurrecting power of Jesus actually transforms everything. And Lord, thank you that we are one body, separated, yes, frustratingly separated, yes, but one body. Lord, I pray that for each of us, you lay people in our hearts that we ought to reach out to. Lord, I pray against that, uh, the thing that the enemy would do, which is to press us into a corner and wait. But Lord, I pray that we would be the proactive people of God for the sake of others, that we will be there for those who we carry in our heart. Lord, use us for your glory, we pray. Lord, thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that it changes everything. Thank you for your blessing in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're coming to the end of our service. Um, we've got a couple of things just to let you know about um, that's going to be happening over December. Uh, one of them, uh, Ian, in a moment or two, I'm going to pass to you and let you speak about the, the stuff you're doing for the families and the numbers of families that are involved, if that's OK, uh, if you're just re ready for that. But the, the thing we wanted to let you know about, and we've written about it in the newsletter, but and we will keep on doing so, is that on Sunday, the 20th of December, we're going to have a carol service, a carol. Uh, uh, it's a carol service where you're not going to be able to sing, of course, but it will be a gathering together at 4.30 for an hour at uh, St. James's Church uh, in Hope, just near Hope Hospital, uh, just at the bottom of Lancaster Road and Eccles Old Road, that intersection. We're going to go there because it means that we can get all of us in socially distanced, safe, not liable to be uh, a problem for any of us. Um, rather than doing it at Holy Angels where we just get sort of like 20 or 30 of you in. So what we're gonna do is do a service there on the 20th of December at 4.30. And we want as many of you as feel able to be there to come along. Um, if you can't, because of uh, your shielding or, or whatever reason, then we will film it and we'll put it out, but it'll be 24 hours later. They, they don't have Wi-Fi uh, in the church and so we can't stream it uh, out. Uh, we would uh, record it. But that's on the 20th of December. Um, we wanted to do to, to mark Christmas together as much as we could. We wanted to have an opportunity where we could gather although spaced out and all the other sort of stuff, but it'll be a great time. And um, we hope that you're gonna be able to join us at 4.30 on the 20th. We'll keep on telling you about this all the way through Advent, um, but um, just to let you know. Ian, do you wanna talk about uh, the, the Boxes of Hope and what's going on? Yeah, uh, just to let you know, uh, uh, I put a few messages out in the half term we did. Um, we were just wondering how we could do something in this time that we're actually allowed to do to try and make be of some benefit to the community. And um, obviously in, in half term, we were able to provide some lunches for some children that would have had free school meals, um, which was brilliant. And then this time we, for Christmas, we thought, what can we do for Christmas? So we, we, we got involved with something called Boxes of Hope by an organization called TLG transforming lives for good and they have given us some money and we also had some money left over from some great generous donations from the, some of you guys and some of the people in the community and so what we wanted to do we just put out a, an advert to see um if there'd be any families that we're really feeling a pinch this christmas anybody with children who would be struggling and we thought you know just let's just ask and see what happens anyway we've, so far i've got about 10 families um all with children uh, lots of single mums with some with several children and um, we're going to try and do basically kind of a, a Christmas hamper come 
food parcel come weekly shop with a few treats and things like that. So, uh, and we're going to deliver them to those people's uh, houses uh, just before Christmas. So, um, if you want to be involved in that, uh, either buying some of the stuff to go into the hampers uh, or putting the hampers together or even delivering them, uh, you know, if you've got transport to go and deliver, um, let me just get in contact with me. Some people have already been incredibly generous um, and given us lots of stuff already, but we've, there's plenty more that we'd love to be able to give. We want to give as much as we can, be as generous as we can to the families that, that are struggling this Christmas. So if you, if you are able to be involved or would like to donate anything, please let me know and uh, would that'd be great. Fantastic. Thanks, Ian. We're gonna. We've got one more song that we're gonna use this morning as part of our worship, and um, I want to say uh, thank you to to Frank and to Nick um, who did the filming and the recording uh, for the stuff that we've done this morning. Thank you for making that possible. I'm gonna hand over the final song, and then we'll pray together as we go. Uh, Jay. Great, great to see um, new, uh, the, not new musicians, old musicians, but a different band playing. Thank you for those of you that played and thank you, Hannah, for leading that through. Really good to hear. We're going to pray together, pray for the week ahead, pray that you'll go as a resurrection people of God, pray that you'll 
go know, knowing that you belong to the connectedness of uh, one another, knowing that the Lord goes with you. You might want to be prayed with uh, about specific stuff that's going on in your lives. Hang around and there'll be people who will be only too pleased to do that. Otherwise, may you know the blessing of God as you go. Lord, send us out in the power of your spirit. Send us out with that resurrection hope that um, death doesn't get the last word. Send us out with that sense of laughter that we know who we have put our trust in and he is faithful to the end. Lord, send us out into our week, wherever that week may be. For those of us in work context, Lord, may we go as people of hope during this Advent time. Lord, for those of us who are much more confined to home, Lord, may your hope fill our hearts so that we can connect with others in the ways we can through text and social media and all the rest of it. Lord, may we not forget that we are the people of resurrection. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for your blessing on our lives. May we serve you well and with joy. In the name of Jesus. Amen.